Hello, hello, hello. Good afternoon. And I'm hoping you're having a good lunch wherever you are. Hopefully there are lights. We are in stage four load shedding. Very difficult times for everyone. My name is Kayasi Tole and I'll be your facilitator for today. It is, of course, the Youth Capital Mail and Guardian webinar focusing on the remarkably critical and important issue of how to unlock opportunities for young people. We do know that, unfortunately, according to the latest data that we've seen from State South Africa in particular, we have a youth unemployment crisis. We have over 9 million young people that are stuck in nowhere. Nowhere land is neither an employment, uh, education or training, and we refer to them as the needs. So there's clearly a lot of issues that we'd like to resolve. So we'd like to hear from you what it is that you think can be proposed and maybe implemented as the immediate solutions in order to unlock this big problem that we have. I will be joined over the next hour by a remarkably esteemed panel of individuals who in their different spaces and also in their collective wisdom have been trying to unpack and tackle some of these particular challenges. My first panelist is Mr. Wasim Karim. You, most of you will probably know him from the National Youth Development Agency. He's the CEO of them. I'm also going to be joined by Kiru Truman, Lian Vivias, and also Chris Christian Duncan Williams. Those are my panelists that will be speaking to you over the next hour in order to talk about some of these issues. We do know, of course, that we live in the age of social media. So if you feel like Twitter is a place where you want to engage with us, our hashtag is Unlock Jobs. Hashtag Unlock Jobs. And the theme for today's event is, of course, clearing roadblocks to youth employment. Now, I don't have any more time to waste because we've got a lot of issues that we want to deliberate on. And Mr. Karim, unfortunately, you first up. I imagine that everybody that is listening to this conversation and everyone in the country is fully aware of the youth unemployment crisis that we have in South Africa. And of course, there's only one way to solve it. And the way to solve it is to unlock the different roadblocks, the different stumbling blocks that exist on the pathway to unlocking these opportunities. You also have a unique position in that you sort of work in the public sector where most people tend to fear to trade. So you're probably best positioned to sort of talk us through maybe some of the key collaborations that we should be looking at to really get a fusion between the public sector capacity. We know the state is wide and large and also some of the private sector skills and some of the learnings and the efficiencies that we've seen being practiced in the private sector. How do we get that fusion right in order to unlock opportunities for young people? Yeah, good afternoon, Kaya. Good afternoon to the panel panelists and everyone who's listening in as well. So I think you you pose a fundamental question around what do public-private partnerships look like, right? And, and I think we should probably start it at that partnerships are not easy by their nature, right? A lot of us set up that first conversation. We sit in these webinars and these rooms and we say, let's partner, you know. Um, we have a first introductory meeting with each other and we, we try different things, but but by their nature, partnerships are hard. Leveling out who contributes what, uh, transfer of resources from public to private, those are difficult questions to navigate around. And, and I don't think South Africa necessarily has the framework for how we collaborate on deep public-private partnerships. Yeah? With that being said, there are certainly examples that one can point to in the South African private sector and civil society that really show ability and skill to, to transcend youth employment. There a couple of examples is the Harambe Youth Employment Accelerator, which has existed over the last 10 years or so. More recently, the Youth Employment Service, which has shown ability to scale a high amount of jobs in a short piece of time. We have many NGOs doing uh, good work in South Africa, Africa, Tikkun, Enka, and many small NGOs which collaborate at local level which you reach up to. Now, a big part of what the sixth administration has focused on is how you get these individual role players to be working together with one another. Um, and the presidency early in 2018 convened many of the large role players in the youth development sector to be able to work together with one another. Now that has culminated in a number of efforts, right? For one, you have for the first time a national pathway management network for young people. Right, where young people inclusively and for free can be connected to opportunities closest to where they live. It has, for example, transformed the way we recruit for public employment programs in South Africa, how we aggregate demand for opportunities for young people. Yeah? Does it solve our economic growth crisis? It doesn't necessarily do so. 
but it does ensure better connectivity for young people into opportunities that already exist. Yeah? And I think this is the type of public-private partnerships that we need if we're going to scale the opportunities for young people and if we're going to meaningfully address the crisis that we face. And I suppose at the heart of it all is simply the question of where that there is that universal understanding across both sides of the table that you can only do so much in your own silo. So perhaps getting our resources together, marshalling resources together is the is the closest that we're ever going to get to, sol to, sol to solving the youth unemployment crisis. Do we have any evidence of those types of collaborations happening maybe even before um, you know, the new administration came in and have those been harnessed to actually sort of create the roadmap towards greater collaboration, Wasim? Yeah, look, I think I think it's to say your point around partnerships is 100% correct, right? Is that how do you get many ecosystem role players? And, and I think we also have to understand that there is often many vested interests in the space here, right? And sometimes it's not easy for people to let go of what they think they're doing, even though it might reflect duplication, right? But, but, but if you take something like Harambi, right? Harambi was partially funded by government over the last 10 years, yeah? And, and that is an example of a public-private partnership established through the Jobs Fund, um, piloted through the Jobs Fund, scaled in the Gauteng province, which has provided a considerable number of opportunities to, to young people. Now, I meet with different stakeholders on an almost daily basis, and we, we negotiate things around terrain. But, but sometimes I feel that when we say social compacts, we think about what that means to say we're going to work together with one another. When we don't necessarily think about the trade-offs that we need, right? Um, a good example is around uh, organized labor in South Africa. So often we'll sit at NADLAC and we'll discuss and we'll say, let's compact around the job summit. Let's compact around the economic recovery and reconstruction plan. But often that means something like foregoing labor increases so that we can accommodate more people in public employment programs. And often that's where we start to really fall short when it comes to policy around what we term partnerships and these kind of social compacts. So I think there is a broad understanding before the sixth administration, in the sixth administration, that these type of initiatives are important. It's hard work. It's hard work on a daily basis to get them going. But I think we are building the framework for what it needs to look like, particularly in the youth sector. Mm. I hope so. And we'll come back to this one. Kiru, I suppose you have the unique insights in that you've observed the things that work and things that do not work. Occasionally, we're going to see a report that sort of crystallizes the scale of the crisis. I don't think anyone doesn't know that the crisis exists. So obviously, the reports that we occasionally get from youth capital in particular tend to give us just a very granular understanding of what the issues are. My worry, though, is that perhaps we've become a country that's become very good at churning out the data, at putting together the reports and providing those insights and not really doing much with that. What is it that we need to be able to do in order to ensure that the knowledge that you've been able to gather through the different platforms, through the different case studies, is then actually utilized to inform the policy formulation of the country in order to fix what is clearly an escalating crisis? You know, Kaya, I'm so glad you said that because I spoke to someone um, earlier in the week and uh, we were talking about reports and, well, do people actually read it? So you can churn out as many reports as you want, um, but uh, do the people who need to read it, read it? And her feedback was, she said, nothing comes off it. There isn't a willingness to do anything. And I think what is so important is, you know, if you if you put a good person against a bad system, then the system will win every time. Mm. And for policy to change, the system needs to change. Um, there's something called, um, it's a little a private joke in the TVET sector, uh, some people may be aware of, uh, it's system fatigue, you mm. know, and you can have the best people in the system but if the system is against you then it it's just going to wear them down and if changes are made um then it's often cosmetic and it does not actually impact the ground so for for 
for proper impact, I would say, um, you need legislative changes. Mm. But uh, the political environment is scary and people are very weary. And those with money are sometimes too scared to invest. Um, so they would rather just put the money in the bank. But I want to go back, though, to what you said about reports. I believe passionately in research and reports. I think because, you know, it develops our critical thinking skills and it mm. gives us knowledge and learnings. And it plays a vital social role in assisting government and businesses um, to develop services and policies. Um, and they are responsive to current needs, I'd like to think. Um, but um, it's, it's an invaluable tool to build on. And it, it just saddens me that uh, there is this perception that the people who should be reading the reports don't. But there's another thing that one must be very, very weary when it comes to reports. And that is reports, you read a report and you put it into your, your framework, your mm. existing framework. Yeah. It's just one report. It doesn't mean to say it's the it. It's the answer to everything. Um, a report needs to give a balanced framework, uh, a balanced picture of the problem. And something we must be very, very, very weary of. And that is we can't get carried away by a report. As much as I believe in them, I love them, I'm passionate about report writing. Um, uh, I believe that any report, any report on something is putting something on the table instead mm -hmm. of shooting your mouth off and giving me nothing. But the reports must be balanced. Reports mm -hmm. must give holistic perspectives. It can't give one dimensional views and we can't get all excited about that. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that, Kiru. And I suppose in a country like ours, where perhaps there are so many different political orientations and political ideologies, perhaps it is the reports, it is the data that becomes the common meeting point where everyone will say, well, regardless of what they feel about how the system ought to work, let us use the data to inform what it is that we do. So I think it's quite critical for us to actually figure out how to best to unlock the value that's been captured in so many reports. And I think this country probably has like an entire database of things mm -hmm. that have been said and things that have been proposed but very few people have actually then sort of then figured out what to do with it uh, leanne i want to move to you now i mean obviously in the type of roles that you've played in society you've literally identified the key needs to be able to intervene in the system the system left to its own devices is clearly not going to get us then and you've found that mentor in particular the key issue that i sort of want to uh, uh, you know deliberate on with you is that unfortunately we do live in a society where even when solutions exist the ability to then effectively you know activate those solutions becomes quite difficult so if we all worked out that maybe the solution to youth unemployment is to give many more people access you know to job opportunities the first problem that we have is that well if they're all online and people don't have data and people can't afford to travel to places where the interviews are we already have these micro barriers throughout the system and those micro barriers when summed up together really do become the stumbling blocks that we're talking about today how do we then start dealing with the micro barriers so that we don't end up with these big potholes and these big molehills that create problems for young people yeah kaya thank you for that question um it's i think definitely something that people don't um talk about enough or look into enough um and and um, Jan, to tell you why why we came up with we did is because at Minter and, and the solutions that we noticed is because, I mean, firstly, I was so shocked when I first realized the cost of looking for jobs, for job seekers. And there's mm. various studies out there that says it's well over a thousand rand per month per person um, often, which is, means it's actually unaffordable. These mm. little micro hurdles that you mentioned all add up. And um, and to, and so the jobs might be, but the individuals just simply can't be found or can't reach it. And similarly, also for the businesses wanting to recruit, especially smaller businesses with limited resources, the time-consuming processes to find the talent out there and searching and the screening, 
we've even found that often they actually stop recruiting and those jobs are being left open and never filled, which is just unacceptable. Um, but but so these micro barriers, I think we, we kind of um, tend to want to solve the barriers and look at a solution for them. We want to make data more affordable, make computers more accessible to people. We want to reduce the cost of transport. Um, but if we want to solve this for millions in South Africa and actually the billions in the developing country world out there, this is quite a costly and uh, quite a big um, attempt. So what we did at Minter is we decided to first look at where are the job seekers at mm. and then build a bridge to bypass many of those hurdles altogether. And so what we realized is that these job seekers are often expected to come to us, to come to our job sites, to come to our offices, come to our internet cafes, community centers. But if we look at where they are at, they actually, we can meet them in their WhatsApp chats. Mm. So if they have a little bit of money to spend, they will buy their WhatsApp bundle because it's their key, key communication uh, mechanism with the world. And they might not even know how to use computers, but they know how to chat. Mm. And they might not have money to, for transport, but they do have their WhatsApp chat with them all the time. So, so we were able to look at the recruitment process and the job seeker process and actually automate that with chatbot and conversational AI um, technology and make it all accessible to the job seekers on their WhatsApp. So which means with, with mean, just chatting on the, on the app, they can build their CVs, they can do skills assessments, receive skills training, apply for jobs all through that system. And then systems like ours that come in and plug into the WhatsApp connects them with the employers and with mm. community support programs. And on the other hand, for the businesses, they can now reach so much more deeply into the rural and marginalized communities to find those talents and recognize them out there with finally having a proper profile and a proper CV that actually comes to their desk. And with the ability to really make a very quick decision on the shortlist of candidates through matching algorithms and other intelligence that can be applied through this technology, they now only invite those in for interviews that really is a good fit for the positions and therefore reduce the costly money that's spent on for these individuals to travel into, um, into cities time and again, just to figure out that they were not a fit and they did not get the job. And so actually, as a result of this, um, through these type of solutions, we found that we reduced the cost in seeking for jobs for individuals by 85%. And mm. for the businesses, on the other hand, is that they improved their job retention of these first-time job seekers by 70%, just with the ability to really actually finally find the talent out there that they need. Yeah, and I think obviously just finding those uh, you know overlaps and those connections within a much a much more complex and a much bigger ecosystem is something that we should be able to sort of do on a more pervasive level. If you are watching, of course, there will be a poll. We have a question for you that we'd like to get your insights on. So it's our first poll question of the day, and it simply says, "How effective do you think government's public employment programs have been in addressing youth unemployment so far?" So if you can just vote on the poll that you can see there on your screens we'd like to sort of hear from you and then i'll share those insights later on to sort of get an indication of what it is that you're getting through this conversation also do engage with us on twitter our hashtag is hashtag unlock unlock jobs we are of course talking about the ways in which we need to clear the roadblocks to youth um, to youth employment crystal i'd like to bring you into this conversation and perhaps there are a few numbers in the country that um present a greater or a more stuck horror show than the idea that over 9 million young people are stuck in limbo. We've got a very fancy term for them, which is the NEAT term, but that simply means that they're not in, in employment, education or training. For me, that is one of the biggest crises here because what I sort of tend to look at is that we do have a system that offers some element of social support to young people, whether it's a child support grant or whether it's even free access to basic education. But then there's this gap where you get transitioned off that social support system and then suddenly there are these years, in fact, these decades where unless you get an opportunity to get onto the economy on your own terms, on your own ability, you literally are stuck in limbo until maybe you turn 60 and suddenly the social support programs are restored to you. That 9 million number, what type of a crisis does it represent? 
Um, I think uh, it's actually interesting. Uh, Rob from Arambi just put a quote in the in the chat there, saying, "You know, if you can't tackle the the youth unemployment crisis, it's not even worth talking about the other problems." And I think that really sums it up actually quite well. You know, my argument to everybody else out there, to the private sector, majorly is. If we don't invest in these young people now, who are going to be your customers in 10 or 20 years from now? If we don't get employment and money into the pockets of young people today, what kind of future does our country face tomorrow? And beyond the economic impacts, the wasted potential of literally thousands of young people, millions of young people across the country who have skills and opportunities and creative ideas and innovative ways of thinking that we aren't tapping into. Um, and a lot of it, as you say, because they step out of school, basic education, where, you know, they might be on a child support grant, they do have access to, to free basic education, and they literally step into nothing. They're stepping out of the school system of support, where even if you're in a poorly functioning school, you have adults that at least know more than you that you can turn to stepping out of that financial security of those extra grants. Um, and often they live in households and have friendship networks who are as unsure about how to navigate that post basic education you know, step. So they have no way to turn, they have no one to help and they have no institutions to help them. Um, so it's a little wonder that young people don't even know where to start looking for jobs, how to even write a CV, how to show up for a job interview. Um, you know, These are skills that I think could be taught in life orientation in school to give young people a little bit more um, of, of a support mechanism when they step into that nothingness, um, as you say. Um, and I think for me, you know, the saddest part is when you talk to young people, this not in, which implies doing nothing, is so far from the reality. Young people are doing a million and one things all the time, trying to get by, trying to get up, you know, some certificate, and ex, you know, to improve their skill set, anything to improve their chance of being employed. Um, and yet, as we've heard in this conversation already, the barriers that, that get in their way are numerous and multiple. Yeah. Wasim, I, I want to come back to you on this one, just as a follow up to that question. I mean, with a crisis of nine million people, I think that's probably if every single one of those people were to vote, they'd probably be in charge of the country. So it's not an insignificant number. And we now speak about all these hurdles that exist and all these roadblocks that exist on their quest mm -hmm. to sort of get an opportunity somewhere. What is it that we probably need to start thinking about doing in the immediate term to remove some of the stumbling blocks? Because for me, that number of 9 million people who woke up today without a very clear idea of what they'll be doing and how they'll be doing it, and more importantly, how they're going to finance it, that for me is an individual and a community and a social crisis that is in need of immediate and urgent interventions. What should we do? Yeah, thanks, Kaya. So I think, you know, to come back, I'll separate it into two points, right? And I think I don't want to harp on on the point, but but I think the National Pathway Management Network, SA Youth, is an important step in the right direction. And just to show you the level of scale it can reach, is when, when we did the Basic Education Employment Initiative, employing 300,000 young people, albeit short-term opportunities, the recruitment for that could be done in a transparent, accountable, scalable, efficient, and effective manner, right? So you could take in the space of three weeks to a month, 300,000 young people out of a million applications are placed at 26,000 public schools, yeah? And within 25 days, they're able to work and earn a salary for the first time. And I think all of us in this room know the impact that a first job can have on, on a pathway into more sustainable employment, yeah? So for one, I have to reach out to everybody in this webinar and on that to say we have to have a commitment to loading opportunities on the National Pathway Management Network because in that way we aggregate demand, young people are able to connect to inclusively, already it overcomes a massive barrier of high data costs because all of the telecommunications companies have zero rated the platform. So already we overcome one major barrier for young people, but also we're collaborating at a sectoral level to aggregate those opportunities for young people. Two, we have seen the ability of the employment stimulus to reach people at scale, right? Out of cost of about 11 to 12 billion, we're able to create 600,000 jobs and livelihood opportunities for people, particularly young people in South Africa. Yeah. Now, if we talk about this crisis of 9 million, do I think we can get to 9 million public opportunities? I don't think we can. Yeah? But can we get to 2 million or 3 million? Yes, we can. And can we break it down to where we're looking at maybe a job in every household? Yeah. 
Because if you can do that through public employment and private sector initiatives, using government's physical space to be able to do that, suddenly you start impacting at household level. And when you impact at household level, you start improving household incomes, which improve educational outcomes, they improve um, additional outcomes. And, and I think that's the way we need to break down this problem if we're going to start to make a, at least a dent in the crisis. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, Kiru, I suppose one of the things that puzzles me the most is that, you know, when we all talk about all these things that need to be done, it sounds like there's a lot of prospective work that needs to be done. And yet, if you look at the data that comes from Stats South Africa, they say to us, you've got an unemployment crisis in the country, 34.4%. We've got a youth unemployment crisis in the country at 74%. And yet, within that same data set, there's a number that puzzles me, that intrigues me, rather. And that one that says that, however, once a person has had an opportunity to, to migrate beyond basic education into the post-school environment and attain a qualification there, in other words, they're a graduate, then suddenly their chances of being employed are close to 90% because graduates are only, there's only 11% of graduates that are unemployed. So for me, it looks like there's already an organic solution that somehow gets this type of outcomes that we want that's already there. The problem though, it seems that there are a lot of people that can't have access that system. There are a lot of people that will never be able to access the system, whether it's because of constraints within the system or whether it's funding opportunities that, lack, that are lacking. Now that we know that this can be a game changer, I think most people would be happy to gamble with the 10% chance rather than the current 74% chance. What do we need to do in order to enable many more people to participate in that system, not just through traditional universities, but particularly through the alternative TVET system, for example? Gosh, you know, how long is a piece of string? Um, you know, uh, Kaya, when it comes to the TVET system, for a while now, for a long while, government have, has invested a phenomenal amount, billions, in the TVET colleges. And you know about the, the stigmas that went with the uh, TVET colleges, etc. cetera. Um, and there has been incredible strides that have been made in this area. But there are still problems, phenomenal amount of problems. And it seems as though, you know, currently we are training young people for an urban environment um, mm. in the hope that they will find employment. And um, it's difficult, if not impossible, with young people who live in the rural areas. So where on earth do we place them once you train them um, in any sector, never mind TVET? Now, you know, th there's also the, um, we all know this, there's always been this very negative uh, perspective coming from employers where the mindset needs to be changed. Um, employees need to become part of the learning journey. Now, what the, the TVET system does is it puts in not just a theoretical perspective to learning, it also gives you work placement. Now, you might have heard of work-based learning and work-integrated learning. And there's a difference. Uh, work-based learning would be the umbrella term that we use to cover all aspects of workplace training from a curriculum. But work integrated learning is a little bit more specific in that that is considered to be part of a curriculum. Now, the TVET colleges offer uh, ministerial programs and occupational programs. Now, the ministerial programs are the traditional NATED programs. And, um, that's the National Education Technical Diplomas. And part of those programs insist that a student needs to do 18 months of work placement um, to get experience in the workplace. That's been an incredible niche in the TVET colleges. But of course, like I said, there are lots of obstacles in the T, uh, TVET sector. And I'm I'm very practical in my outlook regarding this because so much rests on government, on national. And, and Kaya, we can't wait 
we've been waiting and and government does i must admit government has done we have funds that are available to all of our learners who go to the tibet sector for example uh, government i know funds about 80 percent of a particular program for example yeah. an ACED program and then the student pays a, a very small portion you know and i like that i'm i'm a firm believer in the fact that one should pay a little something toward your studies because if you don't if you get everything for free then it's where's where's the pride where's the 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 will to want to carry on look i know i'm generalizing phenomenally but it's just a personal opinion that i have mm. um moving on from there the problem within the tibet sectors are numerous but because i believe we can't wait for government we can't wait for national we've waited years for curriculum change um and we're only just getting there now um, I believe there are little things, little things mm. that we can do that can make a difference. Um, Crystal and her team put together the shift annual report in which they highlighted a stream of, of uh, road action plans. Yeah. That's right. And, and solutions, possible solutions. And I was reading it and wondering, but now, yes, these are great solutions, but a lot of them depend on government. A lot of them depend on national. And I look at the work that uh, Wasim is doing. I'm in absolute awe. Uh, Wasim, I, I thought a couple of days ago, and, and I mean this with all the respect in the world, I thought, how can they put so much on his little shoulders? You know, because there is so much that is expected from Wasim and his team, and they've been doing a fabulous job, an absolute fabulous job. But there must be more. There must be more that we can do. And um, I've, I've got a whole list of things that mm -hmm. I've, listed, I've put down. You know, it's not just <laughs> what needs to happen, it's yeah. what needs to happen and how. So yeah. um, I, can, I can rattle off a couple of things. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back, we'll come back to your I that one. You would. I yeah. thought you would. <laughs> Leanne, I suppose, you know, at the end of the day, perhaps some of the obstacles that are, I suppose, undeniable is the fact that employers may have anxieties around the type of skills that young people are bringing into the workplace. And some may then retreat to saying, well, and, until somebody has trained them, until somebody has sort of gone through the school fees of teaching them the basics, we're not going to engage with them. And of course, some people simply say they call that the work experience requirement, but it is a reality that it is also an impediment that exists out there. And now that we're trying to find ways of sort of migrating and sort of putting together systems and solutions that enable the marketplace to be responsive to the young people that we have rather than the young people that it wishes that it could have how do we then leverage maybe even some of the existing systems whether it's the tivet system to then say well accredin it may look like we are creating far too many um you know uh, mis misalignments within the system there's young people who say they've been part of the system and then the world of work says nah we don't like those skills what can we do particularly you harnessing the new technologies that we have in order to actually start bridging these gaps Sure, um, such an interesting topic, yeah, Kaya. Mm -hmm. I think I think definitely we live in such an interesting era where we we so pressed with this educational um, and skills gap issue in 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 South Africa and globally that there are so many interesting innovations that's coming to light, and um, so so I cannot agree more with the concept that employers need to be open minded to recognize people's potential and also take responsibility for training and teaching them on the job and not expect the finished product to come to their door. Um, mm -hmm. and, and to agree with you, what you said earlier, Kira, I think that is that is so critical that every single person in society realizes that we have a role to play. And if we are open-minded about that, we can see solutions that we wouldn't have recognized otherwise. So to tell you how what we recognize is if we look at the educational system and um, and, and look at solutions that's been developed for it, incredible solutions. However, some of them are so, or many of them are so costly and, and hence um, not um, reachable by the majority of the companies or the individuals out there. 
But if we can look at it in terms of the whole process and break it down into more digestible chunks and then identify elements or stages of the educational process that can actually be delivered much more efficiently at scale in other mechanisms than classroom based training or on the job training or even um, online training. And yeah. so, for example, what we did with Mentor is that we identified we can leverage chat based learning to deliver some of those elements of training that's delivered, for example, at TVETs or colleges and in make it so much more accessible to the wider, wider population out there. And so, for example, into level basic level skills that generally is and is um, costly face to face training can be done at home by the individuals at their own pace at their own space. And then if we move further down that line where it becomes more practical, these learning chunks on the job can actually be delivered also via chat chat based products or WhatsApp so that individuals can learn on the job, which is so much more intuitive way of learning to many out there. Um, for example, with interactive quizzes, short videos, and even assessments that can um, assess where they're at and also be tailored to individual specific knowledge gaps so that they can focus on what where their weaknesses are. Um, and so if we deploy those type of mechanisms, and for parties to come together, then you can actually enable the TVs to deliver um, their type of skills to the broader audience out there, potentially even that's already on the job and focus on the chunks of skills that they need and then make it so much more accessible to them via this chat-based learning approach and make it also relevant to the skills that the employers need on the job. Key considerations there. And I think poor Crystal has to bite the bullet for all of us. Crystal, you know, when you speak of the 9 million people that we say are stuck in limbo, not in education, training or employment, one of the key questions that tends to arise is perhaps the rigidity of the way in which we recognize people's skills and people's competencies is a limitation here. So I may well have gone to Wits University to pursue a four-year degree, did well for the first three years and only stumbled in my very last semester. When I exit, actually, I have nothing because the last time I ever completed any form of, of qualification was in matric. So suddenly I get classified as someone who has nothing more than just a matric certificate. But I've been able to gain some skills, some you know, competences within that four year period that I spent at a higher education institutions. And of course, the system doesn't currently recognize that. Is there a case to be made for alternative ways in which we can certify people based on what they've experienced rather than what the utopia ought to be? Because we seem to be saying until you reach the final mile, you actually haven't started running the race, even though they have run the race. Absolutely, Kai. And, uh, you know, this question does come up a lot. And I think we've got to look at it from two sides. We're, as I say, we've got to, you know, we're building the plane while we're in flight. So we've got to try to catch the people that already been out of the system have already stumbled at that block as you say and then at the same time for younger people coming through the system what options can we offer to them um, that are shorter term that require less time less financial investment or more feasible because um, you know we've just done a recruitment process and i can't tell you how many cvs i had where young people said incomplete due to financial resources mm. or fight you know financial insecurities or lack of finances you know something along those lines and um and it was encouraging for me to see that young people are starting to put that on their cv to say i did i got as far as this these are, these are the subjects i did and so mm. it's wonderful that young people are doing that so the call now is to employers to say can you value that and actually read the cv and not say oh, well i didn't complete so i'm not even gonna bother um and so the what we can do for the young people that have not completed is to say to employers to value that because you know they might have completed that three years ago not completed it three years ago um and and we need to value that and then for the young people coming through the system i know there's lots of conversations around google short courses online short courses how do we make these things more accessible for young people and how are they starting to be valued by employers because i think a lot of people will be like oh it's a google online course it doesn't have value mm -hmm. so we need to really start changing how employers think about these skills um, and is it simply that employers themselves have to do you know an, a skills test for the job you know personally when we hire at youth capital there's always an assignment component so you know a young person can prove their skills in that assignment component without having a piece of paper um, because you know if, even if I look at myself my skill set and where I've ended up aren't necessarily matched at all on paper um, but that doesn't mean that I can't do the job so I think we really as a society need to start thinking differently um, and we need 
need to leverage the zero rated platforms and the movement, uh, you know, the conversations around using WhatsApp or big platforms like SAYouth.mobi to open up the gates for young people coming through and then to value those young people who have gone through the system already. How do we value the skills they do have differently? Yeah, and I think that will probably be a big, big shift if we can be able to do that because it will obviously clear so many roadblocks that a lot of young people have where we're not recognizing the skill set that they do have. We have got the results of our first poll and I can tell you, Wasim, that the question was how effective do you think government public employment programs have been in addressing youth unemployment so far? The results aren't particularly good. 53% say not effective at all and 38% say somewhat effective. Earlier on, you mentioned that the, the basic education program that put together 300,000 young people into the world of work was one thing that obviously probably did make a difference. We also received a comment on the chat box that talks about the sustainability of some of these programs. If it's short term, it's not a sustainable job. How do we then actually make them, you know, uh, the type of programs that are sustainable in nature and actually give people a fair chance of getting into the workplace and then remaining within the workplace? Yeah, thanks, Kaya. So I do think public employment programs get a bad rep from people in orange EPWP uniforms, sometimes photographed sleeping under a tree. And I think that's sometimes where the bad rep comes from. But if you, I mean, if you delve into the quality research that's been done both on EPWP and CWP, you'll find that, particularly from a household income perspective, those programs have done a lot to alleviate, I wouldn't say alleviate poverty, but at least manage poverty in South Africa. Yeah? Um, and, and we have to consider ourselves, I think South Africa is probably at a fundamental fork in the road now, whereby we, the national treasury and policymakers are trying to take a decision about whether you go with a basic income transfer um, or whether you, you, you stick to trying to stimulate public employment through, through, through these numerous programs that we have, right? I think the DBE program differed from D, from CWP and EPWP in one fundamental way, in that the ability in which it was able to scale, one, which I've mentioned before, two, that it was the first public employment program to pay at the national minimum wage, and three, it specifically targeted young people, particularly young women, and it's reached geographical reach. We have 26,000 public schools. It reaches almost every single community. Now, Crystal and her team have done a good report on that. They found some positive findings, some negative ones, but I'm sure we'll start to get more research out of phase one and phase two. The intention is to make it a full 12 month program as part of the medium term expenditure framework. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is a fundamental cultural question we need to answer, right? And the, the majority of the research we find is that young people prefer an employment opportunity than they do a basic income transfer. Right, um, a basic income transfer is more efficient. It's uh, it's probably more targeted in nature here. But young people want to work. We know that they want to work. They want quality, meaningful work, and we know that that sometimes grants can be unsustainable in the long term. So, the question is, how do you reform or reform the public pro employment programs that are not working? And there's an yep. entire team working on CWP and EPWP, but I think programs like that have value. I think okay. you have to take the positive elements and you have to reform yeah. the elements that may not. And, and just scale them up. I think that's probably the key thing in how to make them, um, you know, reach the type of skill that people can see that they're working. You also mentioned, obviously, the work that's been done by Crystal and the team. And Crystal, I want to come back to you because obviously in putting together the reports that you and you, as Youth Capital tend to produce for us, you have to tap into the pulse of the most affected people, and these are the young people of South Africa. Now, I want you to sort of give us some insights into really the type of key insights, granular insights that you're getting from young people. Meanwhile, there is already our second poll question out there, and it simply says, how do you rate the importance of certification as a strategic priority to tackle youth unemployment? So you have a few more minutes to vote on that one. It's really key. And this is simply the question of, should we be able to give people a form of certification to acknowledge the skills that they have rather than ask them if they ever completed their final exam, particularly given the financial and resource constraints that a lot of people have. Crystal, back to you. Talk us through some of the insights that you get from young people that you engage with. Yeah, we think obviously this is key to how youth capital operates and anybody that knows us knows that we are constantly trying to talk to young people. We don't believe a once of conversation is sufficient. Um, and so 
you know, any work that we do always involves tapping into the network. Um, and I think when we hear feedback from young people who have come through these short term opportunities and I've, you know, I've been following some of the conversation in the chat around the short term opportunities conversation is that um, young people are really, you know, they suddenly have a purpose for getting up in the morning. They feel like they're making a difference. Um, but then it's this again, they step into this abyss of now what? Um, so if we look at phase one and how it ended, there was so much uncertainty. I think literally like on the last day of their contracts, they were told it was going to be extended for another month, maybe the 30th, if not the 31st. Um, and so young people are literally just left hanging and on the edge of their seats about what next. And even though they got an extension, it was, you know, another month. I know from talking to young people that went through phase one, many of them just sat at home for this entire time. And now when phase two came out, they all are applying again um, because nothing really changed for them as a result of, of, of that work opportunity, except that they had some money. They got really excited. A lot of the young people we spoke to were suddenly you know, sure that they wanted to have a career in the education space. Um, and so I think if we're going to present these opportunities to young people, we need to target certain sectors where we see there is growth. We know that the Department of Education is stretched, that teachers are under-resourced, that classes are big and teachers really need the extra help. Do we start then pipelining young people and providing um, longer term opportunities and actual career paths that we map out for young people when they exit these short term opportunities. We look at the early childhood um, development sector and, and we look there as well to say we need more ECD practitioners. How do we give short term opportunities that are government funding that by their very nature cannot be infinite in length and we recognize that. But how do we start giving young people opportunities and pipelines for that next step and giving them the information to take that next step? Because that's where young people get stuck. When we ask them, were you given information? Do you know what you're going to do next? There's a lot of question marks that are left in young people's minds. And this is such a missed opportunity. Yeah, and I think obviously those missed opportunities are things that we can no longer just keep deferring and say somebody's going to solve that problem later on. It is an immediate need. It's something that needs to be fixed with the greater sense of urgency. The poll is about to close. If you'd like to still vote, please uh, do lock your vote then. I see there's obviously the first answer that is leading so far, but I can't tell you what the final score is until everyone has indeed voted. I mean, you know, we've obviously spoken about the fact that there's clearly a lot of roadblocks that need to be, um, you know, cleared for young people. The awareness is there. The acknowledgement is there. How does this then move away from being a webinar, from being a talk shop to actually somebody saying that in the next three weeks, in the next three months or in the next three years, these are the roadblocks we had identified. This is who we spoke to about the roadblocks. And this is what we told them that they need to do in order to actually clear the roadblocks. Or do we simply just speak in a vacuum to ourselves and nothing ever gets uh, actioned? No, no, never, never. Kaya, I feel very, very strongly, you know, that when we talk about something like this, it is such a hot topic and young people are angry, everybody's angry, employers are negative. No, we need to look at this problem from different perspectives. The report, the SHIFT 2020 annual report, gave a brilliant perspective of students, um, their view, young people, all right, where they are coming from, what their needs are. Now, the next one should be on employers. Then we need to look at what the colleges uh, or the academic institutions' perspectives are. And only then can we get a holistic view of where we are at. Remember, we spoke about research at the beginning, and I'm yeah. very weary of the time. So I want to move on very quickly. Um, I'm also looking at some of the questions on the, the chat, and I can tell people are angry. People want to know uh, what are the the um, gaps, the negatives, the problems at Tibet, et cetera. Something that we all need to do if we feel strongly about this topic is we need to read. We need to read on our own. And then when we have webinars like this, I feel it's important to try and come up with solution, something, some solution, not generalized and idealized comments. We all know there are problems. We need to leave with some positive energy at the end of this session. And for me, I was trying to figure out now, we know what needs to happen, but now how do we make this happen? Do we wait for who? So 
with regards to colleges, we know one of the problems would be the tracking of learners. Now, we could turn around and say, well, that's a problem at national. Yes, it is. I don't have time to wait for national. We have brilliant IT departments at the various colleges. We have passionate people working at the colleges. I know this. I am a college person myself. I was a college person myself for decades. Um, so put together systems, and I know of many, many colleges who are, who have put together um, tracking systems. But the problem is um, we're starting to track now. What about the people from 10, 15 years ago? Mm. You know, these are our young people who are, who are fighting and arguing at the moment, and they have every right to, because they yeah. weren't, you know, we all had blinkers, you know, well, yeah. yeah, in those days. Then the other thing is the work readiness programs. Work readiness programs at colleges are taking off only now. And I was thinking, so our current learners, are having brilliant, uh, a brilliant time at getting all of these um, work readiness programs. They are starting from year one um, at NQF level uh, four, five, six, et cetera. Mm. But now what about my learners from 10 years ago? What about 15 years ago, eight years ago, six, two years ago? What about them? And then I thought, why doesn't or why don't the TVET colleges put out an invitation to all of the students who have completed their national diplomas or didn't complete their national diplomas, just put out an invite to them and say, we are offering work readiness programs. Um, if you send out an invitation to 20,000 students, then you might get 1,000 responding. You might get 800 yeah. responding. And that mm. is better than nothing. And what are you doing? You are going to be training them, preparing them for the jobs they are put to handle all of this. The other yeah. big problem, I want to rush through it very quickly, if that's all right. Mm. I'm um, get, get, getting problem, out of time. <laughs> I know, I know. Mm. The other problem is the CETA funding. Mm. And that's totally, um, it ranges from 2,000 to 8,000. And there needs to be standardization. Now, CETAs don't have to wait for the minister to tell them what to do in terms of this. They can have meetings. We have CETA clusters at the moment, and they can put this out. The yeah. other very, very important thing is we need uh, young people themselves. Uh, we need a change in this millennial minds, uh, mindset. Yeah. Because, you know, I read an article where uh, this person said, students are not prepared to start at the bottom and to work their way up, and everybody wants to be a manager. So educated millennials are fussier than ever, and there's an ever-growing need that things or, or idea that things literally come for free. So yeah, no, thanks, Kiru. Yeah, no, I, I need to move on to the next speaker. Yeah, Le Leanne, Leanne, you know, one of the key issues here is that obviously there's big government and there's only so much that big government can do. What is also acknowledged is that small businesses, you know, the, the, the smaller entities have a critical role to play because they obviously have perhaps are more agile and more fluid. But I suspect that also a question of resources relating to them so that they can assist in lifting some of those roadblocks is an important one. What are the things that are unique or specific to small businesses that we need to be able to look at so that they become the employers that are enabling many more young people to enter into the workspace? Oh, yes. Okay. So, so important. Our small businesses really are the future opportunity job creators of a country that's going to solve, in my mind, a big part of unemployment. It is a reality. Small businesses have very limited time in resources and, and management. Generally, managers that recruit, they don't know how to, they don't have the time to do so. So they end up just going for the net, people in their network and, and next to them and employing the wrong people and they drop off the programs or the jobs and it just wastes everyone's time and money. But what small businesses can do is they can tap into resources that are available that already have done the hard work of finding those talent out there and helping them portray their potential with adequate CVs and, and profiles. So mm. instead of going to the normal job sites, they can tap into resources like um, Mintel's chat based platform and all the many, many not for profits and other organizations out there to mention Harambi, Jobjack, Giraffe, um, and so many other local operators that actually find the right talent for them already so that they can get the right people in the job 
But I think the one other critical thing is to for, for businesses to look at their current employees' workload and try to identify those entry-level portions of employees that really can be done by somebody else that's entry-level or low-skilled and take that burden off the existing employees and really actually do get somebody else on board to do those jobs, even if it's part-time, and so that they their um, more skilled staff can focus on what they are best at. And that will also help the business to grow and hopefully eventually even create more jobs. Very key, very key, a very important considerations there. Now, Crystal, the report that you've put together, I think it probably is the type of blueprint that a lot more people in policymaking and, you know, critical decision making roles should be looking into and also be able to say how it is that they're going to activate it. I like the fact that essentially youth capitals initiatives and reports are driven by the idea of an Plan. And if you guys would like to get access to the report, it is already available on the chat. It's also, you can see there's a link there. It's definitely worth reading and worth engaging on. Crystal, final word to you. I mean, the report is out there. Talk us through what you as Youth Capital are hoping are the one or two initial tentative steps that people in serious positions of authority can take in relation to this report and start making a difference for the lives of young people. So I think, you know, it's easy in these conversations to feel overwhelmed by the scale of the problem and the scale of the solutions that are required to tackle it. But I think what we've always said and why we have 10 action points as opposed to one broad sweeping statement to tackle this is we need to meet young people on the journey where they are along the entire journey. And so I think if what I would hope that people take away from the report, um, you know, for, for government that it's there's actually small tweaks to what government is already doing that could amplify the impact hugely, like we've spoken about with the Basic Education Employment Initiative. Um, and, and there are practical solutions that we need to start moving on and that government needs to consult the smaller organizations, the ones on the ground doing the work to understand really um, what, what will work in practice and what doesn't work in practice. You know, and then at the other end of the spectrum for organizations that might feel like their contribution is small, um, you know, get behind the action plan, youth capital. Um, this is the first time we've put it out for people to endorse and say, we believe this is the, you know, the blueprint for tackling youth unemployment. And, and the idea is to form collaborations around each of the action points because no one of us, not even Wasim, can attract, can, you know, get, all 10 points are right on their own. Um, it's a collaborative effort, as was said at the beginning, you know, we talk about mm -hmm. social compacts. What does that mean in reality? And at Youth Couple, we're really trying to say, in this publication, there are practical steps from WhatsApp bots that small organizations can implement all the way through to big government programs that we need the government to kind of tweak to make it work better. And so my call would be to people to read the publication, to get in touch with us and start moving into a space of solutions, even if you feel it's a small solution, um, that no solution is too small and that together, the cumulative effect of that could be huge to really start chipping away um, at this 9.1 million meat and, and counting. It definitely sounds like a big number. It definitely does feel overwhelming if you look at the big picture, but I suppose it's going to be the baby steps that get us there. And I think by starting just to put together reports of this nature and giving people the idea of an action plan, whether that's 10 steps or you maybe have to commit to one, it may actually help us move this story a bit further. I'd like to read the results of our last poll. It's obviously divided opinion. The question was, in your opinion, who should play a key role in taking youth unemployment? 11% say the private sector, 11% say civil society and NGOs, 5% to parents and educators, and another 5% to young people. And of course, the most universal answer is the one that says all of the above. And I suspect that that is indeed a reflection of what needs to happen. It has to be a cross collaboration across different stakeholders, individuals, corporates, government agencies, in order for us to say that we're trying to st starting to make a dent in this massive crisis that we have. We are trying to unlock jobs. We are trying to remove the roadblocks towards young people's ability to get jobs. And I think this conversation is just a start. And the report that has been put together by Youth Capital, it's available out there on our chat box, is a remarkably important contribution to what has become a remarkably important conversation for the country at large. Thank you very much for joining us. Unfortunately, we are completely out of time, but we'll definitely try to schedule another session of this nature, a follow up, particularly if maybe we're able to convince some of our big business leaders to start reading the Youth Capital Report and start implementing some of the action plans. Thank you very much to the Maiden Guardian.
to youth capital and to the DG Mari Trust for actually facilitating our ability to have this conversation. Have a wonderful afternoon and please vote on Monday. <laughs> Goodbye.